You wander down a dark road after work one night. The streets are peaceful and the streetlights are on. But you can't help feeling that you're being followed. And as you round the corner onto your home street, you see a figure walking in the opposite direction towards you. So you cross the other side of the street to avoid any suspicion or to avoid whoever might be over there that you don't want to meet. And as they start to get closer, the stranger crosses the street. At this point, you know there's something up. You get ready for a confrontation as the person gets closer and closer, two houses down, now one house. Now, they're just one fence away from you, and they stop. You can't see their face, for their hood, for the hood is f covering their face. But if they start to look up, welcome to Scary Stories. Volume 2, More Scary Stories. Who has? These scary stories will take you on a strange and fearsome journey where darkness or fog or mist or the sound of a person screaming or a dog howling turns ordinary places into nightmarish places where nothing is what you expect. People have been telling scary stories for as long as anyone knows. From the first, they were tales of supernatural creatures that people feared would harm Boogeymen, monsters, demons, ghosts, and evil spirits lurking in the dark, waiting for a chance to strike. We still tell stories about creatures we fear, but not all of them are about boogeymen and demons. Quite a few are about living people. You'll meet some of them, a fat and jolly butcher, a friendly girl who plays a drum, a neighbor, and others who, at best, are not to be trusted. Scary stories of this kind often have a serious purpose. They may warn you, they may warn young people of dangers that await when they set out into the world on their own. But for the most part, we tell scary stories to have fun. We turn out the lights, or we just leave a candle burning. Then we sit close together and tell the scariest stories we know. Often, these include some that have been passed down over hundreds of years. If a, scary, if a story is scary enough, your flesh begins to creep. You get shivery, shaky, screamy feeling. You imagine hearing and seeing things. You hold your breath as you wait to learn how it all ends. If something startles, if something startling happens, everyone gasps and jumps and screams. Some people call those shivery, shaky, screamy feelings the heebie-jeebies, or the screaming memes. The poet T.S. Eliot called them the hoo-hahs. You'd better read the stories in this book while you are still feeling brave and before it gets dark. Then, when the moon is up, tell them to your friends and relatives. You'll probably give them the hoo-hahs, but they'll have fun, and so will you. Something was wrong. One morning, John Sullivan found himself walking along a street downtown. He could not explain what he was doing down there, or how he got there, or where he had been earlier. He didn't even know what time it was. He saw a woman walking towards him and stopped her. I'm afraid I forgot my watch, he said, and smiled. Can you tell me what? Can you, can you tell me the time? When she saw him, she screamed and ran. Then John Sullivan noticed that other people were afraid of him. When they saw him coming, they flattened themselves against a building or ran across the street to stay away from him, to stay out of his way. There must be something wrong with me, John Sullivan thought. I had better go home. He hailed a taxi, but the driver took one look at him and sped away. John Sullivan didn't understand what was going on, and it scared him. Maybe somebody at home can come and get me, he thought. He found a telephone and called his wife, but a voice he did not recognize answered. Is Miss Sullivan there? he asked. No, she is at a funeral, the voice said. Mr. Sullivan was killed yesterday in an accident downtown. 
The Wreck Fred and Jeanne went to the same high school, but they met for the first time at the Christmas dance. Fred had come by himself, and so had Jeanne. Soon, Fred decided to take Jeanne. Was to thought to Fred. Soon, Fred decided that Jeanne was one of the nicest girls he had ever met. They danced together most of the evening. At eleven o'clock, Jeanne, Jeanne said, "I have to leave now. Can you give me a ride?" "Sure," he said. "I've got to go home too." I accidentally drove my car into a tree on the way over there. Oh, over here, Jian said. I guess I wasn't paying attention. Fred drove her to the head of Brady Road. It was in a neighborhood he didn't know very well. Why don't you drop me off here, Jian said. The road up up ahead is a really is in really bad condition. I can walk from here. Fred stopped the car and helped out, and, and held out some tinsel. Have some, he said. I got it, I got it at the dance. Thank you, she said. I'll put it in my hair, and she did. Would you like to go out sometime to a movie or something? Fred asked. That would be fun, Jeanne said. After Fred drove off, he realized that he did not know Jeanne's last name or her telephone number. I'll go back, he thought. The road can't be that bad. He drove slowly down Brady Road through a thick woods, but there wasn't a sign of Jeanne. As he came around a curve, he saw the wreckage of a car ahead. It had crashed into a tree and caught fire. Smoke was still rising from it. As Fred made his way to the car, he could see someone trapped inside, crushed against the steering column. It was Jeanne. In her hair was the Christmas tinsel he had given her. Pictures for reference. One Sunday morning. More pictures for reference. Ida always went to seven o'clock church Sunday morning. Usually, she heard the clanging of church bells while she was eating breakfast. But this morning, she heard them while she was still in bed. That means I'm late, she thought. Ida jumped out of bed, quickly dressed, and left without eating or looking at the clock. It was still dark outside, but it usually was dark in the same time of year. Ida was the only one on the street. The only sounds she heard were the clatter of her shoes on the pavement. Everybody must already be in church, she thought. Ida took a shortcut through the cemetery. Then she quickly slipped into the church and found a seat. The service had already begun. When she caught her breath, Ida looked around. The church was filled with people she had never seen before. But the woman next to her did look familiar. Ida smiled at her. It's Josephine Kerr, she thought. But she's dead. She died a month ago. Suddenly, Ida felt uneasy. She looked around again. As her eyes began to adjust to the dim light, Ida saw some skeletons in suits and dresses. This is a service for the dead, Ida thought. Everybody here is dead. Except me. Ida noticed that some of them were staring at her. They looked angry, as if she had no business there. Josephine Keir leaned towards her and whispered, Leave right after the benediction if you care for your life. When the service came to an end, the minister gave, her bl gave his blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you, he said. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. Ida grabbed her coat and walked quickly towards the door. When she heard footsteps behind her, she glanced back. Several of the dead were coming toward her. Others were getting up to join them. The Lord lift, us, lift up his countenance to you, the minister went on. Ida was so frightened she began to run. Out the door, she ran, with a pack of shrieking ghosts at her heels. Get out, one of them screamed, another shouted. You don't belong here, and ripped her coat away. As Ida ran through the cemetery, a third grabbed the hat of her head. Don't come back, it screamed, and shook its arm at her. By the time Ida reached the street, the sun was rising, and the dead had disappeared. Did this really happen, Ida asked herself? 
or have I been dreaming? That afternoon, one of Ida's friends brought over her coat and hat, or what was left of them. They had been found in the cemetery, torn to shreds. Sounds. Picture for reference. The house was near the beach. It was a big old place where nobody lived for years. From time to time, somebody would force open a window or a door and spend the night there, but never longer. Three fishermen caught in a storm took shelter there one night. With some dry wood they, f they, f they found inside, they made a fire in the fireplace. They laid down on the floor and tried to get some sleep, but none of them slept that well. First, they heard footsteps upstairs. It sounded like there were several people moving back and forth, back and forth. When one of the fishermen called, Who's up there? The footsteps stopped. Then they heard a woman scream. The scream turned into a groan and died away. Blood began to drip from the ceiling into the room where the fishermen huddled. A small red pool formed on the floor and soaked into the wood. The door upstairs crashed shut, and again the woman screamed. Not me, she cried. It sounded as if she was running, her high heels tapping wildly down the hall. I'll get you, a man shouted, and the floor shook as he chased her. Then silence. There wasn't a sound until a man who had shouted began to laugh. Long peals of, hor of horrible laughter filled the house. It went on and on until the fishermen thought they would go mad. When finally it stopped, the fishermen heard someone coming down the stairs, dragging something heavy that bumped on each step. They heard him drag it through the front hall and out the front door. The front door opened, then it slammed shut again. Silence. Suddenly, a flash of lightning filled the house with a green blaze of light. A ghastly face stared at the fishermen from the hallway. Then came a crash of thunder. Terrified, they ran out into the storm. Thank you for joining Mr. Chrome on tonight's Scary Stories. For more scary stories, tune in next time, and any requests are welcome as well. In the meantime, let the darkness take control. Mr. Chrome, out.